recording. Excellent. I can see the recording is happening. Um, we are going to be joined by uh, Michael. I'm going to introduce, let Michael introduce himself. But um, if you've got any questions, uh, do ask. We will be putting some time together at the end to go through any questions. So. All right, Greg, thank you very much for the invitation. And folks, it's great to, to be with you today. And as you can clearly hear from my accent, I'm from Germany, from Bavaria. And I'm going to talk today about information design and information graphics. I put together some slides to, to introduce you to that uh, topic that is gaining ground for about 20 years now and arrived in the core set of communication methods uh, next to illustration, next to layout and so on. Um, but first of all, just to give you a little hint where I'm located, that's a map of Germany and the green part is the state of Bavaria and our capital is Munich, but I'm teaching information design at the University of Applied Sciences in Augsburg. And you probably don't know much about uh, Bavaria, so just two quick uh, bullets into that direction. First, we do have the original Oktoberfest over in Augsburg and in, in Munich, sorry. But uh, if you want to come over, you're invited to stay in Augsburg as well. And another thing you probably know we do have is the Neuschwanstein Castle, which actually inspired Walt Disney uh, for his logo, company logo. Um, I'm located in that U-shaped building um, at uh, our university, that's the faculty of design or department of design and with the two wings with uh, labs and workshops and teaching rooms and in that historic part you see um, there are the professor's offices. So um, you may wonder what information design does in Augsburg and how it is taught. So information design is part of the undergraduate and graduate programs we do have. And I'm showing you that slide here um, about the course structure we feature in our bachelor course communication design. But within that, um, students from the fourth semester on are allowed to choose and stay in a study track. And I'm uh, the head of the study track information design. So about one third of all credit points students can earn in their bachelor program, they can earn in the field of information design. So that's a lot and that's a unique concept in Germany. Uh, this is the entry uh, to my classroom and that's the cow Berta, the transparent cow, as a symbol for what information design is all about, to provide insight. I'd like to show you some of the student works uh, that we did over the last years. And um, this one was an interactive um, thing for the iPad uh, about uh, knots, hitched and bends. And that student, she was an industrial climber, climber for Greenpeace, you know, the guys who pull down the huge posters um, on atomic plants, for example, and she always wondered uh, what the capability of the knots uh, would be that she was using. So she decided to investigate not only um, the, the type of knots, but also the different types of ropes and how to pull together uh, the knots. Another work was carried out by David uh, Gärtner. He did a piece about the resolution 181. That is the United Nations uh, resolution that uh, allowed Israel to stay in that area after World War II. I think it was 1948. Uh, and as you know, that uh, 
um, resulted in a, in a huge conflict that is unfortunately unsolved today. And um, it's hard to get an overview about that conflict, its history, and the death toll and everything. So he decided to do a timeline where he explains um, how the, the borders changed over the years, what the death toll is, how many people um, uh, are, are staying in Palestine or Israel and vice versa. Then uh, we often get offers from uh, German newspapers to work for them. So a semester project could be an infographic, a full page infographic uh, about different topics. And um, so the students, as you can imagine, are really proud when these pages are, are published at the end of the semester, which happens quite a few times. Students also um, are doing interactive uh, stuff like uh, Alexander Jan, who, who was interested to learn how mechanical wristwatches um, are working. And she did that, uh, he did that um, final degree work in um, Adobe Animate, so when it was really new. And um, he really liked to work with that project because he prepared everything in Illustrator, of course, and then imported it into uh, Edge Animate. But um, when I asked my students, uh, when, when do you think um, started the history of information design and infographics, they would refer to a time frame when probably the Mac was invented. But of course, uh, that um, discipline has a broader history. And I'd like to show you some example from that broad history. So this is uh, a stone carved map of the village of Bedolina in Italy. And uh, as you can see, it, it dates back to 1500 before Christ. And for me, the interesting thing here is that these people, although they never have been up in a balloon, they were able to translate their, their city into a map as if they would hover in a balloon over their um, city or village. And they also were able to put in the people, the animals, and they counted the people living in each block. This is a, a very famous uh, infographic I'd like to show you. It, it looks very simple because it's just two line uh, charts, but William Playfair uh, added something that is often overseen even with modern information graphics. He not only displays displayed uh, the numbers, but also um, did annotations, balance against and balance in favor of England. So it's not only about visualization align, uh, alone, but also about explaining the data you're about to display. This one is a very famous map by John Snow, who was a doctor in London during the cholera outbreak in 1848, where he did something that modern data visualization, uh, visualization people are still doing. They are matching data sets. So John Snow tried to find, to trace down the source of the cholera outbreak, and he was not sure what it was. So he mapped all cases and death from cholera. These are the, uh, the black dots. And he related that data set to another one, all the water pumps or water wells in that area. And as you can see, right in the middle on Broad Street, there is one well or one pump and also a lot of people that died of cholera. So he turned off that well, destroyed it actually, and the cholera went away. 
This is another very famous one that you've probably come across already. That's Napoleon's march from the Baltic states towards Moscow. And it doesn't only feature the route that Napoleon took, but also the amount of soldiers he lost on his way towards Moscow and back. He had a huge loss of soldiers there. But um, Mina, who is an artist here, also matched uh, the way back from Moscow with an, um, a temperature chart which sits below um, that other part. And you can actually see how that temperature is going down and down and down. You have to read the temperature chart from the right to the left, by the way. All right, but information design and information graphics nowadays are often not only one piece, but for example, the Washington Post in 2010 did a huge thing about top secret America. So the secret network of government and its contractors. And it was a mixed thing that happened on the Washington Post's website and also happened in print. And also the design might look different. It, of course, it had to look different because of the medium that was used. It still is something that carried the readers from the web to print and back again. Here's a detail. But now, um, Let's try to define what information design is and what information graphics are. So I, I, I try to coin it in, 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 in Uh, Michael, we've just lost your audio. Um, one, just sorry, folks, just bear with us. We will get this sorted. It just clicked out very quickly. Um, let's just say here, Michael, lost your audio. Uh, Um, right, something not quite why well, I can see it. M Michael, do you mind dropping out and coming back in again? We seem to have lost you. Uh, folks, can you just let me know if you've got my audio and then I can double check to see whether we are, uh, if it's one or both. Yeah, you can hear me. Okay. Yeah, Michael, I'm really fine. Thanks, folks. Uh, we're going to ask Michael just to drop out and then pop back in again. Um, so bear with us. It's the joy of the internet. Just got to keep an eye out for him. Let's get this down here. Okay, he's back in. Okay, Michael, yeah, we sorry, we we lost your audio just uh just before we trans uh transition to this slide. So oh, hopefully yeah so no, it can you see again yeah let's just no. ask you everyone can you see it here all good yes. folks for us to continue yeah all right so uh, for now okay. I, I would like to uh, ask you to to read these two sentences what i consider to be information design and infographics so um 
I'm referring to information design as the discipline, uh, theory and practice and processes of building a product that I call an infographic then. All right, so this is an example for a um, well, very well executed uh, information graphics by Alberto Quadra, who was uh, the infographic artist at the Washington Post a few years ago. And you see um, uh, quite a mix of visual clues here and uh, visual language, different visual language. And we will dive into infographics in a minute, just to show you a little example here. Um, in my class, I'm subdividing the field of information graphics um, into these three sub uh, fields like data graphics, object graphics and spatial graphics. So data graphics is all about data and data relations. I'm, and I'm, I think it's important to, to, to coin it that way that it's always also about relations of things, of data, of geospaces. This is a short example for a data graphic from the 1914 Statistical Atlas of Switzerland. And I'd like to show you the, the um, bar chart on the right that uh, solves one problem in uh, data visualization uh, in a very clever way. That's the contrast between a small number and a huge number. And it's called the, the, the bended uh, bar chart or bar graph, if you want. So still all the math teachers can pull out their rulers and uh, measure the values out of the graphics. This is very important. This is a, um, an object graphic that shows uh, the outer contour of uh, that animal, but also the inner parts of it at the same time. So the whole thing and its parts. So parts. So this is what object graphics is about. But often you don't have uh, these outer contour of an object, like in that case, um, where you in a kind of a flow diagram uh, where, where you can read um, a comparison between the United States political system and the United Kingdom. Maps are uh, a visualization of its own. This example is from 1985, Konstantin Anderson, who unlike Google um, also uses an axonometric view that makes you want to dive into that city and walk the streets. So it's a very attractive uh, thing also. Or this, you probably know that, that's the election map by the New York Times. So before that, I, I told you a bit about what I call the DNA of information graphics, but you can't spot that in the wilderness um, as an isolated thing. Often, like in that example, data graphics and maps are combined. So, but one of the, the, the first questions my, also my students are asking me um, is, when should I design information graphics? How can I decide uh, to do all the research and um, to, to, to dive into the, the problems of infographics and its visual, their visualization? So I, I, I collected um, a set of six hints uh, when you definitely should use information graphics to convey your message or to visualize something. So the first thing is when information is invisible, when there's no visual representation available. So this is a very famous graphic by Professor John Grimwade of Ohio University um, about the transatlantic superhighway. So, and you can out of a sudden imagine how it is organized that 
no airplanes collide over the Atlantic on the way to and from Europe. And you can easily understand the system here. Or when information is scattered over time and space, or if you want to, to show different aspects of, in this case, um, the albatross. So on one hand, you see the inner parts of that albatross, then you see some maps. So when information is scattered and you have to collect it from different sources, then it's often a good idea to visualize your findings. When information is abstract, when you can imagine how that should be, when it's saved in a code that originally doesn't work, for example, an Excel sheet, where it's hard to tell the biggest number from the smallest number, then a visualization will help you to find the highest or peak value in a set of data. Number four, when information is complex, the, um, when it's not nonlinear or has many interdependencies, like this um, diagram of the Titanic or the Titanic itself. Or when information is a collection, when it's counted, measured, or looked up, like the Amer America's fiscal landscape. So the revenue by source and the spendings by agency. A visualization helps you, in this case, to understand um, how that huge amount of money, where it comes from and where it goes to. When information is imaginative, when it only exists as an idea or an imagination, you know, we are, we are planning to go to Mars and we have to communicate this to the people but we cannot take any photos of the camps on Mars, so we have to invent them, we have to visualize them from our thoughts, our ideas, our hopes. Good, and now let's talk, talk a little bit about the methods that are used to visualize information. And um, that means actually the design part and designing information graphics differs a lot from designing regular layouts. Uh, but you know from regular layouts, books, posters, brochures, that there are specific methods to design these. And we also have these methods when it comes to in designing information graphics. And I'd like to introduce you to 16 or 17 of these methods. Visualization is the first method, so we have to visualize information and it's a translation, as I mentioned earlier, but by actually doing, carrying out that translation, we have the control over the whole image. And in this slide, I'm comparing an actual um, emergency room with a graphic of it. And while you see all the clutter on the photo to the left, everything seems to be well organized and overviewable on the right side. Everything is well ordered and you can identify single objects like the person laying on the bench there. And the most interesting thing about that graphic is that it obviously doesn't matter whether you keep a consistent perspective view or not. So the, the person is depicted from above while all the technical machines are depicted from the front. Still, it looks like a homogeneous visualization. Modulation is also something that is very important when it comes to designing information graphics. Um, since you are working with Adobe Illustrator, for example, as a vector tool. You have the full control over every part of the image, even more than when using Photoshop. 
So enhancing or reducing details in some parts of an image is called modulation. And you can look inside the um, 16 chapel, while on the other hand, the front windows are, are visible at the same time. Progressive disclosure is a concept that got lost over the last, um, let's say, 80 years. But this example from my collection of historic infographics brings that back. So this is a step-by-step -step display by complex information. And this is actually what we nowadays would call a flat book. So uh, it explains the modern motor car, what was considered to be modern that time. And you can see below uh, the wheels that we have something that looks like a flap. And actually we can flap down the front part of that car. So after we enjoyed the chassis, we could flap that down and take a look inside the car. So we can flap that back and forth at our own pass, at our own speed that we need to, to take in the information. And in this case, it doesn't stop here. So we do have um, another layer here and I'm flipping that one too. So it's down to the frame here. Well, this is called progressive disclosure. Another thing is important that's the perspective view onto the scene you're trying to visualize. And there are two major ways. So the one is the mono perspective or coherent perspective view. Um, most it's carried out as a, uh, in most cases, it's carried out as a bird's eye view, like in this little map of Venice, Italy. But often that's not enough. So as you might have guessed already, next to mono perspective, we have, oh, another example first here. So we are hovering above the scene and we are looking into that church here. Multi-perspective views, that's also something, like in this graphic, where on the top we see some block images, um, and then we have a 45-degree view into the crater lake, and in the lower part of the graphic you can see a satellite image from straight above. So often the perspectives are mixed to uh, support the message or to support the insight into a complex topic. Another um, thing is lent out from comics and that's called sequencing information. And from these three panels that you can um, find in the book by Hergé, you can tell the whole story of the looping of that yellow airplane. And I'm showing you an example now from, I guess it's a Japanese newspaper. And although probably most of us are not able to understand what, uh, what the text says, we still get some of the message uh, by looking at the sequence of the tooth here. And of course, it's about paradontosis. Securing perception is another important concept. As we all know, we are more or less experts in visualizing information. So often we cannot draw to a, down to a level where we could vis visualize everything. So these breakout lines and the words next to it connect directly to the visual part here to secure the perception. So these labels help us to understand the concept, even though the visualization might not um, allow enough insight. Models are often used to explain complex things. So this is uh, a graphic that, an infographic that was published by the German weekly Die Zeit, it's a weekly newspaper published in Hamburg. 
and they try to tell their readers how the newspaper is produced every week. And um, of course, they are not comic-like figures, these journalists over there, and they don't approve a page by, by lifting a, a green um, thing. And of course, also in Germany, um, the post people uh, have to wear helmets. So a model is a distilled visualization. It emphasizes those facts that should get conveyed. It's a simplification also. Guiding the reader is another important concept. If you look at, the co at complex visualizations, you often don't find the landing spots for your eyes and don't know how to, to, to find your way through that visualization. And in that case, it's also done by the isotype, in, was done by the Isotype Institute a long time ago. There is that yellow line that you can follow uh, the history, the life history of the wire worm from the start to the end. And these helping elements um, are great because um, they would um, help you even to follow that story if it's not in the reading direction. Simultaneous presentation and classification, comparative charts, they're also called comparative charts, are a great thing um, to, to make, in this case, animals comparable. Their size, how they look, how the colors match, and so on. Or like in that infographic uh, by Adolfo Arans for the South China Morning Post, on top of that graphic, you see a kind of a reference comparative chart of uh, the different types of whales, how they compare in size, how endangered they are. You could never gather these walls, uh, uh, whales on one photo, for example. So you have to design that. An allegory is often used to explain complex topics to the general public. Like in this very famous uh, poster by Fritz Kahn called The Man as Industrial Palace. So he's comparing uh, the inner functions of a human being to industrial um, processes. And although it's, we, we all know that it's not true that the eye works like a, a photo camera, he still uses it as an average um, thing to explain what that could be, how that could work. Richard Selwerman, who is one of the grandfathers of information design and who coined um, the, the topic of information architect. He, he says there are mainly five different ways to sort information. And that could be location, alphabet, time, category, and hierarchy. Like in this chart from a German newspaper about Christmas trees. Providing context is something that is very important. We often have uh, visualized information and don't know how big, how tall something is. So in this um, graphic by Alberto Quadra, again, he uses a slightly different um, way of visualizing the human figures in opposite to um, that horse. And providing context doesn't stop here. So if you look at the lower part of the infographic, that tells you how that group of actors actually moved that horse. So that's a kind of a secondary level here that tells you more details about how that horse worked on stage. Number 15 is simplification. 
This is very important. Nobody of us wants to see an actual photograph of a human being here, cut open by a doctor maybe. So simplification is a concept that allows us insight into critical topics also. So it, it, it helps not to get shocked by visualizations, by photos. So this is a reason why often with accidents um, you will find information graphics. So these translations, simplifications will help you, help you to digest uh, maybe shocking information. Integration. In opposite to, to most regular layouts in books or newspapers, um, information graphics integrate different codes like photography, graphics, text, color. Like in this uh, very early book about skiing that explains um, skiing techniques. And while this spread I'm showing here uh, still um, separates the photos from the graphics. The next one clearly tells you what integration is capable of. So the red text focuses your attention and the duplex, uh, the double photography tells you what to do and what not to do, what to avoid. So this is integration. Very important when it comes to complex visual displays is you always have to design a hierarchy in time and space. So that means you're, you're actually designing, building, layouting the visual hierarchy of, um, of a graphic. So in this example, you have a sequencing going on. You see the numbers one, two, three. But then your attention is uh, directed towards that three-dimensional, very detailed sequence of that part of the skin. While in the lower part of the graphic, you have a rather two-dimensional display of uh, more information. So by arranging uh, information on a 2D space, you're also in um, direct, you're, you're also directing the reader's attention here. So these were 17 uh, methods that are often used uh, to design information graphics. And I hope you enjoyed that talk and I'd be happy to take questions now. Thank you very much. Michael, that was that was, a, as, as I think, uh, was it Jesper? He said, in, insanely impressive graphics, but insanely impressive uh, breakdown of the graphics. So really massive thank you. Um, thank you. Folks, just while you're digesting that, just while you're, we're, we're just sort of digesting what we've just heard there, because that's a huge amount of information to take on board. Are there uh, any key questions, anything... Um, that you would like us to go back across or that you would like to know a little bit more about? Uh, Michael, while, while folks are thinking if there is anything else that they want to ask, I have a question, which is, you know, it's, it's more of a personal question in some senses, but would, this feels like a, uh, not just a profession. Is this, is this, um, is this, uh, dare I ask, is this an obsession? Is this something that you've always been interested in? Or is this something that gradually over your life you've become more and more focused upon? I just got kicked out. Sorry for that. So I hope you can hear me again. I'm back. I'm back. Yeah, right. I'm sorry. I was in the middle of asking you a... A ridiculous question, but I, did you hear what I was what I was saying? No, sorry, I, I didn't. Okay, uh, just just watching it, and it's the second time I've I've seen this. I've been lucky enough to to see this in the flesh as well. Um, 
But is this is this something you were interested in as a child? Is this something that's developed sort of gradually? Um, is it an obsession? Um, uh, you know, is it just work? Yes, um, uh, of course, it's an obsession, as you might have um, noticed. But everything started off when when my grandmother, I was ten years during that, that back that time, decided to go uh, to, uh, to 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 move to a home for elderly people, and she asked her grandchildren to to come over to her house and to pick up one thing that uh, we should keep as a reminder of her presence. And I didn't know what to take, and I took the tallest, uh, the biggest book that she had on her shelves, and that was an atlas that's uh, from the from 1900. And I was so impressed by the um, uh, star maps and, and uh, even parts that say undiscovered territory that I really uh, got caught by that. And later on, when I attended art and design school, my professor asked me, to do my final thesis about information graphics. And I decided to do so in 1991, when over here in Europe, almost nobody um, was able to design that and didn't know about that. And I'm feeling comfortable in that field now for over 25 years, and I don't want to move into another field. Um, OK, there's some, um, thank you. That's a. <laughs> Fantastic answer. There are some questions coming in. Um, I'm unsure if you want to pick any out. We're not going to be able to go through them all. Uh, yeah. M. Stein is asking, in the current day, what's the minimum number of methods that can be used in a single image? Um, <laughs> that's, that's a hard question to answer. Yeah, the minimum number. Um, well, <laughs> I mean... Um, uh, the, the, these methods are um, one level above the regular rules that you normally apply when it comes to designing infographics, um, like the Gestalt laws, for example, or the object identification theories. So um, you should very well choose your, your methods. And um, depending on your audience, the visualization can also get more and more complex. But for a general audience, you should break information graphics down to easy to digest um, pieces. Thank you. Agnes is asking, what, what's the very first step of your process in creating infographics? Yeah, the very, very first um, uh, thing you have to do uh, this reminds me to my last week's uh, field trip to Berlin when we used uh, when we visited um, the Springer Publishing Group and they have an infographic department uh, and you, when you enter that department through a door there's a little sign up on the wall that says no information question mark no graphics exclamation mark so the first thing is to research your information, to get a, an overview about the topic you want to translate into a visualization. And this is not only about collecting from different sources, that's also about um, analyzing that information in order to build what I often refer to as a mental model of the whole thing. And Designing an infographic often is to externalize that mental model into something that is actually vis visible. Okay, I'm just, uh, Emily and Doug uh, are asking, um, they're making a point that there's a huge amount of detail in some of these uh, infographics and or information designs. Um, and that readers with short attention spans might not actually understand or um, absorb all the information. Is that important? Is that can you elaborate on that idea? Yeah, um, I see. I see that point. Um, but um, 
uh, one thing I want to, to start with is um, I, I have talked about modulation and modulation is um, setting up uh, the, the level of detail differently in a graphic. So um, it often happens that infographics are so detailed and so overwhelming that you can't keep your attention span that long. So this is actually right. What we, some of the methods I introduced you to um, try to avoid that overflow of uh, information by maybe, let, let's talk about that uh, chunking information. This is something that is very important. And that's a concept we know from comics, from, from, um, from our phones, for example. And um, when it comes to designing infographics, you always have to keep in mind your intended audience. So uh, a scientist is capable of uh, taking in more details than the general public, than kids or journalists even. So you have to level that uh, level of detail according to your intended readership or audience. Uh, we'll just do a couple more if that's okay, because um, there, there's lots of good questions here. But but Kurt is asking uh, in industry, what what is the workflow to produce? Um, for example, he's he's asking about the medical illustrations, for example. How many people would be involved in that, and what's the sort of what's the what's the process? What's what's the team uh, doing? Yes, um, so we, we just finished um, uh, a project for a huge energy provider over here in Germany where we had a team of six people on the um, making side, so the six information designers on, on, on our side and about six people um, on the industry side. And on our side we had one um, guy who analyzes all the incoming information and it's it's very important to have on, on a company side to identify the people who really know about the topic and it's often not on the management level so I, I don't know how it is in the uh, medical industry but with the energy provider um, that was uh, the people actually talking to the customers and selling solar panels or e-mobility products. So this is one thing you have to look for, for the people who know, who have the information. And that's not often um, an easy task, looking at, um, at, at large companies. So we, we had one uh, guy who, who analyzed all the incoming stuff and then we had two people trying to sketch out uh, the infographics and it's a, a it's a process like a sipper where on, on one side you have the designers and on the other side you have the people from the company and the, the sipping process is um, that it's um, um, a, a highly frequent process so it's it's um, every Monday a meeting and every Friday another meeting to see the results and ask for more information. So it's a back, it's a constant back and forth. Oh, are there more questions? Oh, um, somebody, Kurt Dreyer, was asking for, for, for uh, good resources. And um, there are a lot of resources out there. And what I would uh, recommend to start at university programs, for example, the University of Ohio has a program um, in information graphics like the University of Michigan has and the University of Miami, for example. And in Miami, Miami. called Alberto Cairo, and he did two books uh, that I really recommend to, to read. Ah, I see. 
Oh, we seem to have lost Greg. Oh, oh no, he's back. Can you, can you hear me? me okay, Michael? Yes, yeah. I can. Audio is good. Oh, well. Just one final question, Michael. Um, I just lost it. I had it in my sights and then I lost it. So here you go. Um, you, you talked about where a good place to start. Uh, I've lost it now. Sorry, let me. Okay, I think. Um, oh, it was just somewhere there was a question and I apologize for whoever asked it. But, you know, what in terms of the work you've shown today, you said I think the, some of the some of the pieces were 50 years old. Um, how, do you see it as being a more relevant now, or was it more relevant 50 years ago? Well, um, I, I, I think my, my opinion is that we are standing uh, on the shoulders of titans. So um, it's always good to look back into history, to learn how that uh, discipline uh, started off. and. Um, of course, back then, these visualizations were more relevant than today. But you also have to keep in mind that for the young students we are teaching, the old stuff is the new stuff. They are used to working with computers, smartphones, and modern software. They are also keen to learn about the history. So I'm often using these, for these students, highly attractive pieces. To, to explain the basic principles of information design. Excellent. So what I'm going to do, I think we've we've I've, I've, we're not going to answer all the questions. So I'm sorry if we didn't get to your questions. But I would like to say once again, thank you, Michael. That was fascinating. Um, and ask for a, a big round of applause, a big global virtual round of applause. So uh, um, <laughs> really, really interesting. Second time around for me. And still is interesting, more interesting. So, uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, there was, I, sorry, Greg. I, Greg, I'd like to thank you for for inviting me. It was a huge pleasure, and I hope uh, my English was good enough for you to to understand. And all of you who, who joined in from all over the world, I really would like to thank you for participating. And of course, I'd like to offer to you to stay in contact through all the social media channels if you want to, or even stop by in person. And I would be happy to show you my collection. And I have to say, if you ever are in Bavaria, one, Bavaria is very beautiful, but um, the college, the university, is a fantastic place. So do take Michael up on that if you get the, if the chance. And, and you do have Michael's uh, details there. So if you do want to ask any questions, as he said, that's your option. Um, just before we leave, we will be following up. Uh, it may well be tomorrow. It might be early next week uh, with an email to all those people who signed up to attendees who are here, and the recording link will be included in that uh, in that email. So if you did miss it, if you missed the first part, or if you just want to watch things again, um, we have recorded it. In fact, I will stop the recording now.